Hey, welcome to another edition of Talking Out My Ass, the sub podcast of, or sub genre of, uh, tangentially speaking. Uh, this is going to be a special, <clears throat> interesting, strange, hybrid edition. Uh, I'll tell you the story. I was in Spain recently. Uh, we've got our stuff in storage there. We were moving it from one storage area to another storage area. And uh, Cassie and I spent an afternoon trying to sort stuff out, you know, because we don't want to pay to store things that uh, we don't need. We don't even know what they are. Honestly, I wish the whole fucking thing would burn down and I didn't have to worry about it anymore. But since that didn't happen, we're going through boxes and... I found some boxes of old uh, papers and I was going through looking for material that might be um, pertinent to the book I'm writing right now and I found a bunch of uh, things I had written uh, that I've been storing and uh, what I'm going to read today is an essay that I wrote about the next phase of my time in Alaska. I don't know exactly when I wrote it. It's just uh, printed out here on some yellowing old paper. I think maybe I wrote it in the 90s, possibly. Could Yeah, it must have been in the 90s at some point. Um, there's no way to tell from the paper. It's it's uh, and there's no date or anything on it anyway. So I'm going to be reading something I wrote probably 10 years after the events I'm actually talking about. And so, uh, you know, if if you're interested in this kind of thing, it gives you some insight into both, you know, the events I'm talking about, but also um, how writing style and voice evolves over us. Uh, time and, you know, life experience and so on. Because if I were writing this now, I wouldn't write it the way it's written. So there's sort of a double historical um, window here. Also, I might I might uh, get confused because I've changed the names of the characters uh, in the podcast, but they're written in their original names on the papers. <laughs> <laughs> so if I fuck it up, I apologize to uh, to the people in question. I mean, it's kind of stupid that I changed the names anyway. I just figured um, the guy I'm calling Russ might not want people to know that he was in prison for four days in Alaska, even though, you know, he really didn't do anything terrible. Um, hanging out with me was his, his main um, offense. But I did mention drug use and things, so, you know, people should have the right to to decide whether they want those things publicly known. Anyway, so I'll start reading this. I'll, I'll interject along the way, uh, of course, but uh, in general, I'll read this. It's just called Kenai, and it recounts um, when uh, Russ and I got down to Kenai, which is where we had decided to, to look for work, and um, Brad was already there waiting for us because you know, obviously he wasn't in prison, so... <laughs> I don't remember where he must have like left our bags with someone that he trusted or something. But he took off and went down to Kenai from Fairbanks. And um, and then uh, Russ and I headed down together after. So here's how it starts. The night Russ and I arrived in Kenai was one of the few nights I remember as actually being dark. Nighttime at that latitude doesn't really happen. It seems like it will, and then it seems like it has. As I remember it, the sky begins changing color at around 11 or so and slides into a long, lazy sunset. From about 2 a.m. until 4, it's dark enough to see a few strong stars, but it certainly isn't what you'd call night. Then the sky begins to grow pink again in preparation for a long wind-up into sunrise. In Alaska, the sun is in no hurry. I remember the darkness of that first night only because of how bright the fire was that we approached when our last ride dropped us off at the edge of the bluff. It was the brightest fire in the whole field of tents and fires, and we thought it made a logical place to begin looking for Brad. Brad was the kind of guy you would expect to find warming himself at the biggest, brightest fire. And he was. We had, of course, been preceded by our fame— 
I had an exaggeration or two to roll with, but on the whole, I'd have to say that Brad set us up pretty well. I'd been assigned the Dylan-esque status of, quote, rebel intellectual, unquote. What the hell else would a black adopted at birth by Mormon cattle ranchers, rock climbing maniac conclude about me? What kind of guy brings half a dozen books with him to Alaska, two of them by Oscar Wilde? I was lucky to get stuck with rebel intellectual for the summer. It could easily have been pretentious dweeb. So before we'd even arrived, Brad had introduced us to the crowd on the bluff. It's a great luxury to have friends who tell your best stories for you when you're not around. Everything is so much more believable that way, and despite the requisite feigned annoyance that your tale has been told to strangers, it's enjoyable to be set apart from the crowd before even joining it. It was mid-June the night Russ and I arrived in Kenai. There were already probably 40 tents on the bluff, which means about 80 to 100 people sitting around hoping for work, waiting for the fish to school. That number probably doubled by the time the salmon finally, finally started coming home around the beginning of July. A few words about the bluff. The bluff was a big flat field, maybe 400 meters by 300, overlooking Cook Inlet on the edge of the ugly little town of Kenai. I don't know how wide Cook Inlet is at that point, but sitting on the edge of the bluff around 100 meters from the water, sorry, about 100 meters above the water, you can clearly see the snow-capped volcanoes on the other side. It's a beautiful sight, made even more so by the knowledge that this really is an edge you're gazing out from. On the other side of that inlet, there are no roads from one place to another, no phone lines, no oil wells, no rusting snowmobiles. There are towns scattered along the edge of Bristol Bay, Dillingham, Naknek. But from your knees outward to those volcanoes and beyond, anything human is the exception. Given the shame and despair I felt and feel about most things human, that sight never failed to move me with wonder and loss, like seeing the virgin before the seemingly inevitable rape. We set up our tents a few meters from where the bluff dropped off into the inlet. We all had good tents, being the sort of college boy, wilderness, techno freaks we were. Brad, being a leader among men, had the best tent made. It was one of those tents that they take to the top of Mount Everest, not for the endorsement money, but because they don't want to die up there. It was a geodesic wonder big enough to accommodate four men waiting out a blizzard. Brad had it all to himself. A little word about Brad here. He was planning to uh, climb Mount McKinley that summer, which is one of the reasons he had this great tent. But he was also just a real, um, uh, he was he was a real outdoorsman and and a sense of the generosity. I don't think I mentioned this in the paper here, but uh, uh, the incredible generosity of the guy. He was carrying a big ass backpack, really heavy with this amazing four-person tent. Plus he had, in addition to all the other, you know, sleeping bag and food and boots and all the stuff that we all had, he was carrying two complete sets of climbing gear because he figured he'd meet people along the road who wanted to learn to climb so he would help them out and, and teach them. So he had extra rope and crampons and all sorts of stuff to help people um, that he'd meet on the road. Uh, learned to, to rock climb. So that was Brad. Back to the paper. It got a little unnerving there day after day, waiting for millions of fish supposedly out in the Pacific to get together and decide to go spawn back in Alaska. We didn't know when the salmon would come and if we would even have work when they did. Every day brought more hopeful workers, but no work. There was desperation in that clean, clear air. So we decided to get drunk. I've been drunk plenty of times, but there's something special about deciding to get drunk. It's like deciding to do something stupid. I know, actually, it is deciding to do something stupid. There's a certain freedom in having declared it your intention right from the start to overdo it, to go too far. Having made the decision to make an ass of yourself, you're now somehow free from future prosecution. So we declared our guilt at the liquor store by buying four bottles of tequila. 
Three Fingers, I think was the brand, for the five of us. And we stepped out into the unknown. And for me, it really was unknown. As I've recounted elsewhere, I'd had a fair bit of experience with various intoxicants available to the curious with connections, and I considered myself a pretty savvy sailor. But not being a big drinker, tequila was something new for me. I can find no reasonable justification for the illegality of marijuana or any hallucinogens, but with tequila, punishment just seems redundant. Anyway, we walk back to the tents by the cliff. There was Brad, Russ, my cellmate, John, another intellectual rebel who'd hitched from Maine to Alaska without so much as a tent. When I met him, by the way, this is the guy I met at Alaska Land from the last episode. When I met him, he was sleeping under a shower curtain. There was another guy, a blonde guy with a big knife on his belt, whose father was some kind of a minister, that's all I can remember about him, and me. As the sun dragged another glacial sunset across the sky, we got down to serious drinking. I was surprised and pleased at how easily the Three Fingers was going down, assisted by lime and salt. Some people get violent when they get drunk, others grow morose and suspicious. After downing about 10 shots in 20 minutes or so, I started getting pedantic. I had some urgent need to read these guys' great poetry. I just happened to have the selected poems of D.H. Lawrence right there with me. I remember opening the book and beginning to read a poem called Snake, which I had read to much acclaim in an English class a few months earlier, and far, far from where I was then sitting. It's a beautiful piece. The words, if read correctly, slide like the serpent it's describing. They hiss occasionally and lazily. There's a reptilian chill to their movement. In fact, this is an aside here, but I remember reading that poem in class. Uh, This was back at Hobart. I was kind of nocturnal. I used to go out at night with a bottle of this white wine I liked. It was this German Liebfraumilch and a glass, a wine glass. And I would walk out to the, um, there was a a kiln where pottery students um, fired their stuff. It was out in the woods near this art museum. I used to walk out there at night and sit under the light that was on all night outside the kiln and read poetry out loud, which really is the only way to read poetry. If anyone listening to this has any interest in poetry, I highly recommend you drink a few glasses of wine, not necessarily cheap white German wine, but whatever you got, and uh, and read the poetry out loud. You need to hear it outside your head to really get it. And so when I read the poem in class, I remember... It was more of a performance, really, than just a reading, which is what good poetry kind of demands. And I remember the teacher, his name was Dan O'Connell. I remember there was a moment of silence when I finished, and he said, that is how you read a poem. It was one of the high points of my academic career. Anyway, that day on the blush, on, on the bluff, I never finished the poem. Somewhere around the point where Lawrence watches the snake take a delicate drink from a pool in Greece, I passed out. I'm not sure how my audience reacted to my performance, but the next morning, or actually the next evening, I found evidence that they'd continued reading on their own. As for me, I was lost in the sort of amniotic haze that only the truly shit-faced can experience as an adult. There were sporadic sensory data coming in, but they were of no use to me. I felt myself being dragged along the ground and heard my pals talking and laughing. I knew I was among friends, so I accepted whatever they were doing as some sort of benevolent assistance. When they put me down, I could feel that my head was hanging strangely, but the thought of opening my eyes to try to see what was going on was far too much. It's a good thing I kept them shut. Hours later, when they'd all gone to sleep and it began to rain, I finally managed to open my eyes and saw that my head was hanging off the edge of the cliff 
And the reason I couldn't focus was that what I was looking at were dark waves breaking on the rocks 100 meters below me. My buddies had decided that I was at risk of vomiting on myself, so they positioned me in such a way that it wouldn't be a problem. Thanks, guys. That sounds malicious, but when you consider their next decision, you'll see that I could have had it much worse. After an hour or two of hearing their hazy conversation and laughter, I returned to consciousness just enough to understand in a rudimentary way that the voices were going on about what a great place this was and how this was such a great moment in our lives that we'd always remember and yeah, so on and so forth. And then I heard the minister's son say something about how everyone, we should celebrate this moment by becoming blood brothers. Everyone loved the idea. Everyone capable of expressing an opinion, I should say. After a few bottles of three fingers, what's any self-respecting adventurer going to say to such a Huck Finn suggestion? Now, keep in mind, this was in 1983, which was before the AIDS epidemic really took hold of public consciousness. Um, in fact, I don't even think there were any articles in newspapers or anything at that time. I remember reading an article about um, an obscure disease that seemed to affect Haitians, uh, like, you know, in the page 23 of the New York Times. So the idea of mixing your blood with someone else didn't have that sort of life or death connotation that it took on after the AIDS crisis really hit a few years later. Back to the paper. My condition, while still decidedly fetal, must have been improving because when I heard the grunts and groans and, oh, that's a lot of blood and other signs of carnage, I curled up a little tighter. Then the inevitable happened. I heard someone say, hey, Chris would want to be a blood brother. Yeah, yeah, Chris is here. He's, he'd want to be a blood brother. Well, I can tell you that Chris didn't know much at that moment, but one of the things he knew is that he did not want to be a blood brother. In my first voluntary moment since the snake drank from that Grecian pool, I managed to pull my hands under my body and hold them there. They could hang me over a cliff, but they wouldn't cut me up, not on my hands anyway. If they had decided to slice open my back and mix their blood in the pool of blood in my back, there's nothing I could have done about it, but I pulled my hands under. After a few minutes of tugging at my arms, they gave up. A little more disappointed in me now, no doubt. The next day, I found the evidence I mentioned earlier in the D.H. Lawrence book across the page containing a poem called I Once Loved a Woman. Someone had written, yeah, in blood, but it wasn't my blood. I shouldn't neglect to mention what happened after the rain woke me up later that night. I instinctively crawled into the closest tent, which happened to be Brad's Mount Everest special. Unfortunately, I ended up vomiting that night, but not over the edge of the cliff. If Brad ever did climb Mount Everest with that tent, I know he thought of me often. <laughs>